Now this is my favorite class of car, original and unrestored. And they really don't get much more original and unrestored than this one, do they? No, they don't, Jay. This is a 1928 Morris Oxford, and it's a really neat example with an estate body by Parks Brothers. Uh, and this is the kind of car, the Morris is sort of the uh, a British equivalent of a Buick. You know, a car for the upper middle class. Right. This is the kind of car that uh, uh, a fellow would have had on his estate if he were a lord, not not a duke or, or a marquis. Right. You know, um, sort and of solid, middle class, uh, very well built car. And this particular model was the first year, I think, of the upscale because the Morris Oxfords were, you know, seven horsepower, six horsepower. Uh, you know, it was not like a Model T, but uh, this was moving into the upper class range. This had the bigger engine, 1.8 liter, 14 horsepower. 14 horsepower. But that's different than American horsepower, isn't it? It was like a Model T was rated at, at 22 horsepower, but actually had, they measured horsepower differently, I believe, especially in England. They did, and this wasn't taxable horsepower ever, which of course is a much lower number, but uh, much like uh, Imperial gallons and U.S. gallons, yeah. the horsepower ratings did vary from country to country at this point in uh, the automobile's history. But, you know, this is the kind of car that was established when cars were more than playthings. They now have become things of utility. Right. If you depend on the car, there are places for you to go. And uh, a vehicle like this, which is outfitted uh, for a, an estate, it's got uh, a little rack on the side to carry your shotgun right. when you went out uh, on the grounds, groundskeeping. And uh, as you said, it has such an amazingly neat feel. This particular example was bought new in 1928 and used by the original owner up until World War II, at which point it was put away. Right. And stayed away in storage until the 1960s, when a British enthusiast got the car out, revived it, uh, gave it a paint job. All they have to do is lightly refinish the wood. The entire wood body is original, yeah. as is the upholstery that we're sitting on. And then he used the car in BSCC events, the uh, Veteran uh, Car Club event uh, in the UK, and until it was sold to the current ownership in the O'Grain collection uh, a few years ago. Well, so many neat little touches, like the American Moto Meter just has a thermometer, a red line. This has a whole bell crank needle deal. I mean, uh, we have to get a shot of that. It's really something. It's amazing because you have to actually read all this. It has cold, normal, and boiling. And uh, the arrow is quite wonderful, and, and the wings are just so incredibly yeah, yeah. evocative of the material, you know? Well, it's a very nice car to drive. I mean, this is a classic example of 25 to 35 miles an hour. You know, it's so funny because growing up in the 60s, it was always muscle cars. I used to think, how boring to drive a car at 35 or 40 miles an hour all the time. People must have pulled their hair out. But it's really for the circumstances you're in. Roads in England were small and tiny. And this speed, what are they going now, about 30 miles an hour? Yeah, 30 Act miles an hour. Actually seems quite comfortable. It seems quite, quite pleasant. And in terms of using your classic car today, use it in these conditions. Driving around here in Newport, it's absolutely perfect because this is all the speed you need. Right, exactly. It's another thing that people often don't think about, think about life with a classic car. You can actually use a classic car, frankly, in so many more circumstances of driving than you might a more modern, powerful car. You have a thousand horsepower, uh, Bugatti or a uh, Koenigsegg, can you just sort of putter around by the beach? Right. How fun is that? Right. I mean, the biggest difference, I think, between classic and modern, modern is the level of maintenance. I mean, yes. this required the oil change probably every 500 miles, something like that. And there were literally dozens of grease points you had to hit with a, with a grease gun and uh, all, all kinds of work you had to do. Yes, driving wasn't simply the uh, sort of get in, turn the key, take off, park the car, forget about it for the next time until you drove it. And of course, that classic second gear whine. You know, whenever I take old guys out, by old guys, I mean guys five years older than me. <laughs> they always reminisce about 
old movies where the cab pulls away and they hear that second gear wind or, or like it's doing now. Happy to pull. It's also a very interesting point in driving vintage cars. Something I learned from my Italian friends about using the gearbox and not the brakes because today we're so used to the Oh, I on do brakes. that all the time with my Jag. With my XK 120s, I always slow down with the gearbox. But I'm surprised at how torquey this motor is. Yes. I mean, I can pull this hill in third gear, no problem. I'm in second right now, but I'm going up at the same speed that we usually have to slow down on these old things. Yeah, it's really capable, capable old motor, as they say in the UK. I think in America, we would call this a depot hack. Exactly. The idea of what you use to, when, your boss or whoever you work for came in on the, from the railroad, you would go down and pick up their luggage in this and there would be another car to take them to the house. Exactly, I think that uh, very likely that this was used uh, originally by an estate manager right. uh, who would go around and, and look at the estate and, and figure out what was going on and all the, uh, how are the brakes? Brakes aren't bad, I'm, ah. I'm, I'm trying them for the first time on it. <laughs> a very steep downhill slope, which makes no sense. You know, you get in the car, hey, wait a minute. Well, that's a lovely beach, isn't it? Yes, it is. The perfect weather, the perfect conditions to drive a yeah. wonderful old Morris like this. Because this, although it's rather chilly, this would be a bright summer, a hot summer day in England. Yes. <laughs> exactly what you'd want and need. One of the things that is... Uh, so interesting about this Morris, of course, the fact that it represents very, what we consider today, traditional British motoring, but also in many ways begins to look forward. It's sort of a transition, um, as, as we said, between the motor car as the plaything of the rich right. and as the sort of the standard bearer of, of modern society. Well, see, for me, 1932 is the seminal year for me. Because that was the year we were in the middle of the Depression, cars were here to stay, suddenly they had 16 cylinders, 12 cylinders, all sorts of wild things, synchromesh on the transmission, four-wheel hydraulic brakes. And this just, just precedes that era just slightly. But really, this is sort of almost like, I don't know what the equivalent would be today, some sort of luxury truck. Maybe yeah, absolutely. You, the crossovers. Would have, yeah, absolutely, the crossovers. The crossovers. Yeah, yeah. Um, because this is a, uh, a vehicle of utility, and yet you can use it not simply for carrying things or picking people up. It, it's an everyday vehicle. You can use it for any purpose. And it just goes to show you, like a book and a cover, a good book, you have to read it to enjoy it. I really like driving this car. It makes me feel good. All the controls sort of fall readily to hand, as they say. Everything works nicely. It's got plenty of power. It is quite pleasant to drive. You know, a lot of old cars, that I get in them, I go, God, this thing is a chore. I don't really like it. Whereas this, I like, you know, I look at it, and I go, oh, that's an old car. I don't know what I would do with it. Well, now I look at it after driving, and I go, I know what I'd do with it. I would drive it, and I would use it. Exactly. I mean, it really is quite pleasant and nice and it just makes you smart. It does everything it's supposed to. The steering is quite crisp and sharp. Yes. Brakes are, are adequate. It, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, they're not discs, obviously, but it stops it fine. I could see myself, if I lived here, owning, well, I kind of do have a place here. Exactly. But I can see this running errands and doing things with it, and, and you see people smile as it goes by, and yeah, you know, it's a lot of fun. It is, you know, you, you mentioned something that, that's really important, Jay, which is, the smile factor. Yeah. You know, when you can drive a car that not only makes you smile as you're driving it, but makes everybody else smile as you drive by, right. I think that's a win. Right. There's there's no aggression about driving a, a Morris Oxford uh, estate car, you know? Yeah. And the nice thing about Original Unrestored is <clears throat> this is exactly what it felt like when the first owner had it. Exactly. Because nothing has changed. And it's impressive. It rides quite nice. It is that uh, wonderful <laughs> type of car that uh, I've talked about a lot with you before, Jay, that has always been a car 
It's never been apart. It's never been abandoned. Right. It was stored for a long time, but obviously stored well. Right. And so it's been maintained to, for use, not made to be overly pretty, not blown apart and put back together better than the folks at Morris and at Parks ever right. did it. And it's, it, it tells its history as, as you ride it and as you drive it. Yeah. I rarely find a restored car that's better than a original. It takes a very, very sympathetic and very talented restorer to, uh, to restore a car to yeah. Absolute original. I've seen cars yeah. that look better and have better panel grip and th a, be uh, a better panel gap and things like yeah. that. But a good example is Porsche. Uh, an original 356. Ah. Oh boy, it really it, it feels so different from a restored one. You're absolutely right. And another example of that is uh, is a Jaguar E-Type. Yeah. As well, when they built those cars. They built them in a certain way, and they just have a totally different feel. Right. Plus, putting the body panels back together on an E-Type is uh, yeah, yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. So, the house that we're going to today is uh, here in Newport, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting house because it also shows the transition between one period and another. And in a very, very interesting way, because it also uh, is a great example of the rise of what we today call the Stark Architect. Because for generations, architects were simply craftsmen, like a, a, a person who painted murals in a church in Italy, right. or the person who built a boat. They were the people that just did the nuts and bolts work, and nobody knew their name. But the house that we're going to see right now was designed by a firm whose name practically everyone knows, even if you know nothing about architecture. Yeah. McKim, Mead, and White. Yeah. So, it'll be very interesting to see this house, which is... Uh, is it on the water? It is not on the water. In fact, it's here in Newport, and it is a summer cottage, but it's very much a townhouse. It is right. a city house. And so we'll also get to see what the difference is with one of those houses as opposed to one of the big waterfront places. Let's go take a look. Okay. I'm sure this is a very unimpressive engine, and I couldn't be more right. I mean, is there a more agricultural looking thing than that? Those look to be almost, although they're not the original plugs, those are pretty old plugs. I mean, this is about as basic as you can get. Look at this thing, four cylinders, 1.8 liter, side valve, single carburetor. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a workhorse. It's also quite interesting that in a time when Generally speaking, the height of an engine determined the height of the radiator and cowl. Right. This engine is really quite low for the time, and it's the radiator and, and fuel tank that really dictate where everything is. And it's always interesting to me that they use a two-bladed fan. I mean, they've known since the beginning of time the more blades, the cooler it's going to run. But I guess in England, they didn't really get hot. And these are for spare spark plugs as well, isn't it? Exactly, you because those, when yeah. you, although the, the motor vehicle had become a very practical uh, appliance at this point, it still was something that you needed to do, as you said before, maintain. Right. So it would not have been unusual for you, while you were using the car, to have to change plugs. But you know, this could sit from 1928 till now and fire pretty readily. A modern car in <laughs> 60 or 90 years, not a chance. Electronics, things would degrade. I mean, this is a mechanical thing, so it's all based on mechanics. You know, all you need is some way to get a spark to it, and, and you're, you're fine. You know, it's pretty amazing. Pretty reliable. These were... These spark, water, gas, and you're, you're, you're done. Yeah, really neat, really neat. So let's take a look at the house that we've arrived. All right, let me shut this. McKim, Mead & White is the first architectural firm that people who knew nothing about architecture came to know. It was mostly through their public work, most famously the old Pennsylvania station in New York City, known throughout the world and modeled on the baths of Caracalla in Rome. Today we're very familiar with the sort of Stark architect, people like Philippe Stark and Frank Gehry, whose buildings and names are very well known. But for generations before this, architects were simply workmen, such as a carpenter or a painter. 
They designed the house, made the plan, other people built them, and people didn't know who they were. The Edgar House, Sunnyside, is the last completed of a half dozen houses associated with the firm of McKim, Mead & White, which is grouped within a few blocks. Sunnyside is a very interesting house, primarily because it's transitional. As the firm moved from their shingle style, in which they'd been building, very typical of New England, to this more formal colonial revival style. Sunnyside is a brick house, one of the first of its type built here in Rhode Island, and quite fascinating because at first it seems to be a very formal, symmetrical house, but it's actually not. Shingle houses are very typically asymmetrical in outlook. From one side to the other, they have different design characteristics, which can also be seen in this house. And it's also quite interesting because it's built with what's called Roman brick. This is a style of brick you can still see in the buildings of ancient Rome, and it became a trademark of McKim, Mead & White. Roman brick is strong, durable, and incredibly stylish as well, in a way that more functional larger bricks are not. William Edgar was the second commodore of the New York Yacht Club. Although he called himself a banker, he was really a yachtsman, living on the family fortune and summering here in Newport. Unlike many of the other houses we've seen in this series, Sunnyside is not a big, sprawling oceanfront house. This is a city house, built on a city lot. It's not a small house at 22,000 square feet, but has a certain scale that is very different from the big grand estates on the ocean. One of the things which is also quite prominent in this house is the wonderful loggia on the second floor. That type of porch, which also became the McKim, Mead & White signature piece, is often seen in this basic form of architecture in Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Seeing it here in Newport was quite a revelation. Sunnyside was quite an advanced and modern house in 1887. appropriate to have a 1948 Hudson Commodore at the home of Commodore William Edgar. Yeah, and this is a precursor to the Twin H Hudson, exactly. which is a big 308 cubic inch six cylinder motor and the two one barrel carburetors. Yeah, I've got one of my, I love Hudsons. They're just a fabulous car. And this is one of the most underrated cars. I think these will start to go crazy because you could buy these for five or $6,000 and within the last decade, and now they've just sort of taken off. They have indeed, and again, it's all about the historical importance of Hudson. In the post-war period, of course, the, the pent-up demand for cars was, was crazy, and the manufacturers could sell anything that they had, any sort of warmed-over pre-war car. Right. Hudson had brand new cars, great designs. This step-down design was really quite revolutionary. Um, sort of the, the modern version of the American underslung, you know, yeah. with, with, with a, a perimeter chassis uh, where you actually step down into the car, so the cars are much lower. This is a really low car for the period of time, and they touted it as a safety feature as well. And the big mistake Hudson made was they never came out with a V8. They had a six-cylinder engine, which was just as powerful, actually had five more horsepower than the Oldsmobile Rocket 88, but that was a V8 with overhead valves. I've got a funny piece of silent film that they used to run in the dealerships of the Hudson dealership that used to run on a loop. And it showed a Hudson and an Oldsmobile. And the mechanic on the Hudson has got the torque wrench and he's just tightening the head. And he goes, there you go, Mr. So-and-so. It's only a 10 minute job. And then they pan over and the Oldsmobile goes, the mechanic going, these overhead valves, how do you adjust them? And the, I was going, I've got a meeting, I've got to go somewhere. I should have bought a Hudson, you know? And I mean, it's a very funny thing, but that was, it was sort of the last days of old technology are always better than the first days of new technology. And that's what this was. This was old technology, proven, flathead, reliable, versus, oh, the fancy overhead complicated, uh, you know, all that nonsense with rocker arms and push rods and all that other nonsense, you know. But obviously that ultimately won out because a V8 is better than a 6. And in people's minds, they couldn't get it out of their head, even though this had more horsepower than the Oldsmobile. Well, this is, of course, <coughs> an 8. This is the, this is the Commodore, so it's got the big 8 Oh, that's it. This engine. is the 8-cylinder, eight eight yeah, yeah. Engine. And it's an incredibly smooth power plant. It, 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 it's very comfortable. This car is absolutely amazing. This particular example, although it has been repainted, has never been a part for restoration. The interior is completely original. It's uh, been saved in part because of the very period plastic seat covers. Right, right. Car. 
And of course, this car is also equipped with practically every accessory you could have gotten on one of these cars. It's got the, uh, the searchlights. It's got this wonderful sun visor, which is incredibly effective. And of course, with the sun visor, you have to have the little uh, prism mirror so you can see the uh, traffic lights. Right, this would reflect and you could see it. Right. And these really work. I've got one of these on my Hudson, and it keeps the heat off the dashboard. So the dashboard was metal, so that didn't heat up and sort of stifle you in the car. Plus, you've got a rear... Uh, rear blind. And a rear windshield wiper, which is very rare. Exactly. And this is a car that just oozes modern style. And it's a shame that Hudson couldn't have taken this to the next step. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and really succeeded in the market because it's really a terrific car, especially compared to its competitors at the time. Right. And as you said, this one is the 8, which is 252 cubic inch. Then they come out with the 6 right after that, which was 308 cubic inch. And these used to win in NASCAR in the early 50s because... The other cars would get them on the straights and the Hudsons would catch them in the curves between the, the torque and the, and the step the down. Does gravity. Low center of gravity, yeah, yeah. But they're, and they were so undervalued for so long. I mean, they're just not, a pre, I think it's a great looking car. I mean, when the Audi TT came out, it was a copy of this. I mean, this was an Audi TT before it even existed. It's very swoopy and streamlined. Yeah, fantastic. Just a sunny side, is a transition from the traditional shingle style to the colonial revival, which later led to the large brick and stone mansions here right. in Newport. We'll look at another car that's a transition as well, a 1937 Darby Bentley. Oh, this is the tenuous was. connection part of the tenuous show. Connection. The tenuous connection part of the program. I love the big headlights. Those are Marshalls? Those are Marshall headlights. This car has an amazing set of Marshall lights if you turn that. Thank you. And take a look under the hood because what makes a Bentley a Bentley? Well, more than one carburetor. More than one carburetor, exactly. Right. 4200cc. Right. Um, inline six. And with those uh, big uh, SU carburetors and uh, a hotter camshaft than the right. original. Right, so this is not a Bentley engine. This is a Rolls-Royce engine modified. Yes, it's based on the Rolls 2025 engine. Right. Um, certainly an engine not known for its sporting pretension. Right, right. As I think we'll see soon, they did a marvelous job <laughs> of adapting this for the Bentley mark. Yeah, well, we can get in, let's get into the whole history while we're driving yeah. it, and we can talk about it. It's best experience. Yeah, and uh, I'm gonna drive it. The up the trouser leg gear shift. So just as uh, Sunnyside represents a transition in design and style, so obviously the, uh, the Darby Bentley is a transition, the right. uh, first of the Rolls Royce Bentleys. And uh, I think, in my humble opinion, uh, vastly underrated. I think that uh, the W.O. Cricklewood Bentleys are fantastic cars, but these are really cars of their own character. They are not just badge-engineered Rolls Royces. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a Bentley that Bentley had nothing to do with. You know, that was sort of the, that was sort of the thing. I'm, I'm trying to think of what a modern equivalent would be. I, I think it, 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 well, there's I, actually a very you will good bristle when I say, yes. but you have the Advanti that was built by Advanti in ah. 1963, and then you had the Advanti II, which was built by a totally different company and shared barely nothing other than it looked like an Advanti. Well, I think that perhaps a, a better analogy might be uh, the revivals of Bugatti. You know, are they true to the character of the brand? even though they're not built by the original people that built them. You mean the modern Bugatti? The modern Bugatti, the EB110, and then the uh, current uh, Volkswagen Group Bugatti. Um, you know, can it proudly wear the name Bugatti in a way that, that, that pays honor to the original cars? These cars are based on the uh, Rolls-Royce 2025 chassis, and the Rolls 2025 is certainly a car that nobody thinks of as sporting, but 
they really took a lot of time and effort with the engine modifications, the uh, dual carburetors, the hotter camshaft, the higher compression, and, and the, uh, the lowered uh, chassis to really make this a very different car in character than the car it's based on. Well, I have to agree with you. Boy, it's very nice to drive. The yeah. performance is quite lively and it handles well. I mean, I have a bit of a grudge because I know that Rolls-Royce was scared to death of the 8-liter Bentley. The 8-liter Bentley came out and it was a magnificent car. It had more power. It could travel at 75 or 80 miles an hour in comfort back in 1931. Rolls-Royce had nothing like it. So when they got the chance to buy Bentley, they did. The first thing they did was crush and throw out the... I wish they had adopted that 8-liter motor and called it a Ro Bentley Rolls-Royce. That would have made it a true Bentley. But they had to go their own way. All right, fine, I get it. I mean, to me, this is a sporting Rolls-Royce with a Bentley badge, which is fine. Exactly. Uh, and, 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 and I have to admit, it's a very nice car to drive. It, yeah, and uh, also, uh, as opposed to the, uh, the critical with Bentleys, you know, the, the most fearsome thing for most people, including me, is mastering the gearbox of a Cricklewood Bentley. And this gearbox is sensational. It's got uh, synchro on uh, second and third. And uh, well, again, so I would say the greatest thing about the Bentley is the gearbox because you have to master it. You have, <laughs> you have to be an enthusiast to own one. Yes. You have to sort of know the ins and outs, which is kind of fun. I mean, that's half the fun of having these old cars, you get them and people go, what are these switches? They're not labeled, what are these? <laughs> well, I'll show you what that is. And you get to show off and be a bit of a, a, a you know, a know-it-all, which well, is kind of fun. But, but they you reward know, the effort. This is very nice. This is, yeah. you know what this reminds me of very much? This reminds me of another, of the modern variation of this car, which would be the Turbo R Bentley. Yeah. Because the Turbo R Bentley was just a Rolls, literally a Rolls Royce that was rebatched. That's all it was. Then they put the turbo on it, and oh my god, it changed the whole character of the car. And they did the suspension and the wheels and the brakes and brought it up, and it really made it a fabulous automobile. I would never think to buy a Rolls Royce, but I did buy a Turbo R because it wasn't a Rolls Royce, it was more of a sporting saloon type of car. Exactly, and actually, I just thought of another great analogy about the transition. Of course, I don't know why I didn't think of it before, but the modern Bentley Continental GT, which is the first of the Bentleys built by um, by uh, Volkswagen after the split from Rolls-Royce. And it was a car of very, very different character and very much, very much aligned, frankly, with this car in terms of the fact that it's a sporting car, not a sports car by any means, right. but a sporting car and well, we really have officially said what it is. It's a 1937 Darby Bentley, four and a half liter. Four and a quarter. Oh, okay, four, yeah, four and a quarter liter. Four and a quarter. And it's a, a one of one in that it's bodied by the Carlton Carriage Company, who bodied very few uh, Bentley four and a quarters, and this is the only open four and a quarter they bodied. Yeah. And it's a car, I think, again, that really captures the essence of what you want to be silent sports car to be. It's very elegant and yet very sporty at the same time. Yeah. It's got this great windshield that you can fold down so you have the Brooklyn's racing screens. Right. Uh, and it's just got enough character. This color is also magnificent. You know, so I think it'd be better suited to call it a GT. It's not yes. really a sports car. I mean, I guess a modern equivalent would be like an Aston Martin. Quite fast, yeah. but extremely comfortable with all the creature comforts. That the leather and all of that. It is a fabulous car to drive. I mean, I've barely put it into fourth gear yet because it's pretty long-legged. you think about... There's no second gear wide like we talked about before. No, I mean, the, the, the length of, of space between this and the Morris is uh, quite substantial. I mean, it shows, it's only nine years, but it shows right. how quickly technology was advancing. And you think about the fact that uh, 1937 uh, was very much the depths of oppression. So to have a car like this really made a statement, you know? And uh, it's the kind of car that, you know, you, you want to take up for your Saturday to Monday in the country. Yeah. Well, 37 was sort of coming out of the depression, wasn't it? I mean, you know, war was imminent, so they were gearing up and jobs were coming back. Yeah, I, 
like to think about 1937 as sort of the time when we can look back on it and say, oh, what was just about to happen. Yeah. They really didn't know. So right. there, there's a certain, again, a certain optimism that, you know, we're far enough away from World War One. They're talking about what might happen in the continent with sort of the tensions that are going on right. with Germany, but nothing had actually happened yet. So maybe we can get through this. Boy, this is a great deal of fact, really a I like way more now than I've driven Because I've always had a bit of a grudge against these. <laughs> Call themselves <laughs> you know. Well, because after, you yeah, know, absolutely. after how W.O. was treated. Actually, W.O. went to Rolls-Royce for a couple of years, but couldn't stand it because he was ignored. And, exactly. You know, so he went to Lagonda and developed a fabulous V12. That was his first modern engine, the V12 Lagonda, 4.4.5 liter, or 4 liter. Another great uh, example of sort of badge adoption, as it were. Think about what uh, Laganda accomplished, and uh, David Brown ended up uh, acquiring Laganda. Right, right. And uh, merging it into Aston Martin. So there's a great uh, history in the UK of uh, brilliant uh, engineering designs being absorbed by other companies. Do you know where Laganda comes from? Laganda's an American company. Yeah, but you know what the name is? Uh, it's um, uh, it's a God. river in Ohio. Yes. It's an Indian name. I think Alfred Gunn uh, got divorced Alfred, and he yes. went to England to build cars and he built the Lagana. And people think, oh, is that some exotic Italian? No, no, it's it's from uh, Chagrin Falls up in Ohio. Area. Yeah. Boy, this is a wonderful car. Boy, this really drives very nice. I'm surprised Rolls Royce did not put their own name on it. Well, it's very funny, um, as is often the case. Um, Rolls, as you said, wanted to, to, to crush the Bentley 8 liter, but they also realized that the Bentley name had great brand equity. Right. They thought, well, what can we do with it? And frankly, for the time, I think in creating this car, they were terrific brand stewards. Right. Uh, in doing something that related to uh, what the Bentley heritage was, but realizing, of course, they're not going to go racing. Right. So they don't need to build racing cars, and frankly, uh, you know, much like uh, we've discussed the, the Duesenberg brothers, the Maserati brothers, um, great engineers, great racing engineers like W.O. Bentley, they really didn't have a handle on what it took to actually market a car that can make a company money. Right, right. Actually, I almost like these cars better as closed cars because it's going to have that sort of English gentleman's club feel, you know, there's a lot of wood, a lot of leather, you know, uh, you, you, you're sort of, especially in a cold day, there's so much fun to drive. You know? Well, because the English never get cold. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and you, being half Scottish, right, you shouldn't exactly. feel the cold at all. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> How was your Scottish bow? Oh, I, I do a bit of Scottish. It's murder. <laughs> I like when I watch Scottish crime drama. It's murder. <laughs> Nobody says murder like this guy. Oh my God, he's been murdered. Right. That's actually wonderful. And uh, to your point, there there are many many beautiful uh, closed bodies on the uh, the four and a quarter chassis. Uh, some James Young coupes that are just incredibly right. sporting yeah. and elegant. They did a wonderful eight liter two door coupe. Enormous thing. And it was oh. I've got a, a, a Mulliner, a four-seater bench. Which is beautiful. Fabulous guy. i got to put a new damper on the end of the crank. I, let me just let's put it into fourth gear. I mean, that's when it becomes the silent sports car. You don't hear anything now. Now, this is literally a car that you could drive on on a thousand-mile rally with a lot of pleasure, you know? Yeah, yeah. You'd be eager to get back into the car rather than saying, right. gosh, when are we going to get to a stop? Right, right. And uh, it's also quite interesting, again, thinking about the character of cars and the house that we visited today, uh, Sunnyside, of course, being the home of a great yachtsman, this really gives you the feel of a really well-balanced boat, you know? Right. Especially driving here along the beach with the smell of the ocean. It's really quite fantastic. But boy, this is a car you have to drive, not collect. You yes. know, that's the great thing about about Bentleys. 
They used to say, a Bentley, you look at the car, or Rolls, you look in the car, because you <laughs> want to see who's driving it. Ah, very good. With the Bentley, the car is the attraction. The car is the star. Yeah. yeah. And of course, as has often been stated, and not just to, to slight the owners of Rolls Royces and the enthusiasts for them, but there's a reason why it's the Rolls Royce Owners Club and the Bentley Drivers Club. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, I know the Bentley Drivers Club is a fabulous organization because they make all the parts. You know, if you need any part for a Cricklewood Bentley or even one of these, it's available. With Duesenberg, hardly anybody makes parts because I think I'm the only guy that drives mine regularly. You know, yeah, oh, absolutely. Take them out once a year or something like that. I remember there was a guy named Jim Schneck who sadly passed away. He built some Duesenberg heads at great expense. I mean, two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the tooling. I mean, and he had a hard time selling because people go out and drive it. It's <laughs> mostly, you know. And uh, that's one of the things that uh, the you know, Dream Collection seeks to do is to get the cars out, to make sure that they're on the road, that they're that they're used in rallies and tours and uh, seen by people because right. the most important thing is to share cars like this with right. a wide public. Otherwise, how can we share our enthusiasm and passion for them? People don't see them and know them. Yeah. Boy, this is a wonderful car. Have you driven this before? I have, yeah. and I love this car. Yeah, it really is nice. And, and it's one of those things that, it's a car that I love on all levels, and I'm sure you do as well, because it's as appealing aesthetically as it is dynamically. Right, right. You know, sometimes you have a beautiful car and you get into it and the driving experience is a disappointment. Yeah. And you think, ah, what a shame. It's sort of like, you know, the, the, the beautiful model who opens their mouth and suddenly like, yeah. Yeah. But, or you have a car that's great to drive, but you don't want to get out of the car and look at it. Well, that reminds me of another car we did in the series, the Duesenberg Model A. Yes. Fabulous power, fabulous engine, brakes. It just wasn't... If it looked like, looked this, like this, they would have sold a million of them because it would have been one of the fastest cars out there and one of the sexiest. As it is now, it's just, oh, a very nice car, but, eh. Right, you think about the level of performance that that car had in 1928. Yeah. And this is a 1937 car that certainly equals well, 1923. that. 1923, sorry. Yeah, yeah. 1923 for that Duesenberg, and this is 1937. It certainly has the same amount of power, but, right. you know, a decade and a half later. Well, Jay, another spectacular day here in Newport, Rhode Island. Another amazing house and three perfect cars. Yeah. The situation for the house. Commodore William Edgar would have loved a car like this Bentley. And it's very much at home in Sunnyside, at home at the New York Yacht Club, at home anywhere. Can't wait to see what we're driving next week.